Renaissance means rebirth, renaissance. The term is used to indicate that during this period there was a revival of interest in the humanistic values of classical Greece and Rome. In fact, people in the Renaissance deliberately modeled themselves after the ancient Greeks and Romans in their feeling of individual and collective responsibility, in their embracing of education, and most important, in their sense of the enduring, enduring uh, human value in the arts. There were three notable changes that took place going into the Renaissance. First, there was more focus on, in, focus on individual achievement. Second, people began to show more interest in the real world than in spirituality. And third, the growing ease of travel and the spread of printed books, the printing press was invented. It led to a widespread mingling of cultures. Renaissance architects throughout Europe used buildings from antiquity as models for their new buildings. This is a picture of the cathedral in Florence, Italy. It's believed that the Renaissance started in Florence. I have a few slides I'll show you in just a little bit. Some historical events during the Renaissance include Columbus's explorations, the Reformation, which was uh, started by Martin Luther in 1517. This is where the church was divided into Catholic and Protestant branches. The shifting of music from the church to the courts, um, and as I mentioned, the invention of the printing press. Probably the biggest important cultural development of the Renaissance was the emergence of something called humanism. This is how Wright describes humanism in our book, but I like um, from the reading a little bit, there's a little bit more. He says, humanism is the belief that people are something more than a mere conduit for gifts descending from heaven. And then he continues with this definition that they have the capacity to create many things good and beautiful indeed to the ability to shape their own world. Composers in the Renaissance started to think of themselves not merely as anonymous churchmen, but as talented artists. And they, they sought credit for their musical compositions. Composers now work their own names into the texts of their comp compositions. Um, an example would be in Josquin's Ave Maria. Listen carefully at the end, he says, O Mother of God, remember me. He uses the pronoun me in his piece. And painters did that too. For example, in Raphael's School of Athens and in Michelangelo's Last Judgment, they actually paint themselves inside of the, the work. Well, I'm going to go through some slides pretty quickly of Florence. This is a terrible picture that I took <laughs> holding the camera in front of my face. That's my son next to me. This is in Florence, and behind us is the Arno River and this beautiful cathedral. Um, it was designed by a, a Florentine architect named Brunelleschi. Uh, he was considered to be one of the initiators of the Italian Renaissance, and his revival of classical forms and his championing of architecture based on math proportion and perspective make him a key figure in the transition from the Middle Ages to the modern era. He's really famous for this original project. Um, this cupola of the Duomo in Florence was uh, actually won a competition, and he was put in charge of it the completion of the building and um, he carried it out with a special technique that made it possible to create the curves of this huge dome without a supporting framework. It took most of his life. Um, when you take a look at that dome, if you get a chance to go inside it, if any of you have been lucky enough to go inside it, it's pretty big. It, it really gives you a sense of the music that was written during this, this time period. There's a, uh, another picture in this. It's actually not syncing. I just didn't hold the camera straight, but I, I like the picture other than that. Uh, there's another picture from the art museum. And another. And another. This is I took off the internet. I took that after I drank coffee. Uh, we had to drink some coffee to wake up. Um, this is a photograph of the coffee that we'd had. Very beautiful. And if you haven't had Italian coffee, it's some of the best coffee in the world. But I digress. I want to show you one more work of art from Florence. This is by Masaccio. It's a fresco. And he became the first major painter of the Renaissance about 100 years after Giotto. This trinity used full perspective for the first time in Western art. Actually, the Romans knew about perspective, but it didn't become consistent until architect Brunelleschi rediscovered and developed it. 
Masaccio used perspective to create an illusion of a figure in three-dimensional space. He was strongly influenced by the architect Brunelleschi. I show you the use of dimension in art so that you can listen for the use of dimension in the music. This week we're going to be listening to sacred music of the Renaissance. We're going to focus on two of the greatest composers, the first being um, Josquin Dupre. He was considered to be the first master of the High Renaissance. The other composer that we'll focus on is Giovanni Perluigi da Palestrina, who came a little bit after Josquin. His music was um, comes out of what's known as the Counter-Reformation. His music was the absolute perfection of the church style. Let's go through some of the characteristic features of sacred Renaissance music. The first feature is that the music for choir was sung a cappella, and that literally means in the chapel style, where you would have just voices alone, no musical instruments. As Craig Wright mentions in his lecture, the choirs were made up of, of all male singers, and he gets into more detail how the soprano parts were sung. So I will let you listen to his lecture because it's pretty interesting. Um, this you will hear in the sacred music, but I would say even more so in the secular music next week. Word painting, I like my definition in, in parentheses here, music word painting is when you have a musical reflection of the text. Wright describes word painting as depicting the text or the words by means of a descriptive musical gesture. Here's a more current example of word painting. Did you notice how after she says the word silence, there is this long pause? That's word painting. The texture of most Renaissance music is polyphonic and based on a principle called imitation. And you should know what this is because we, we went over it earlier in the semester. But uh, anyway, it's this overlap effect. Now, there are passages in Renaissance music where it might be homophonic, with just block chords. And this would give special emphasis to the words. So it's not always polyphonic. And as you'll hear in the hands of Palestrina, he was very careful with the way that he handled it. Um, here's an example of imitation in the Josquin motet as the voices enter in turns. You'll hear this in Ave Maria. Another thing that Josquin introduced was this idea of voice pairing, where he would take the, um, in this case, the upper two voices and pair them together, and the lower two voices and pair them together, where it's almost like a duet. You'll hear examples of this in his uh, Ave Maria, his sacred motet. One other thing that I'd like to add is that, that a lot of people find Renaissance music to sound really consonant. And that's because the, well, one reason is because of the interval of the third. In the organum that we heard last week, uh, in the music of Malchot, which came a little bit later, both cases that music sounded um, harmonically kind of hollow because they were using the interval of the fifth. Composers in the Renaissance started to use the interval of a third, which just sounds a lot warmer to our ears. Um, the con composers continued to write masses after Palestrina into the, you know, in the Baroque period and the Classical period and even the Romantic period and even today. But this, these masses that were written during the Renaissance were not to be surpassed in their beauty. This is some of the most beautiful music ever written, and I, I sure hope you guys enjoy it. <laughs> 